Hey guys, how are you guys doing? Welcome to another lit review where I done down scientific journal articles to my level. So before I begin, I kind of want to apologize uh, to my viewers out there that I haven't been making uh, enough video lately because I've been swamped with finals. I just got done with my finals and also with clinic rotations and just general preparation for a com upcoming externship. So I apologize. I'll try to keep myself uh, on a schedule so that I could produce uh, these videos for you guys. So the journal article that we'll be discussing today is titled Medial Double Orthodesis Technique Guide and Tips. This is written by Eric So, Christopher Reb, uh, David Larson, and Christopher Heyer. Uh, this paper is an instruction, basically an instruction manual how to perform medial double orthodesis. So you guys might be asking, what is medial double orthodesis? It is a procedure that is kind of comparable to triple orthodesis or even replacing it. So primary uh, indication for triple arthrodesis is generally for a pest planus or a flat foot deformity that kind of goes into a stage 3 and 4 deformity where it's kind of severe um, that is needed need of a correction, osseous correction. And triple arthrodesis, like it, what it sounds like, is a fusion of three joints, calcaneal cuboid, uh, talonavicular, and talocalcaneal joint. And another indication for a triple arthrodesis is where sometimes patients who, ha who go through a post-traumatic uh, calcaneal fracture and after a repair, they will often get uh, pain in the joint, uh, like talocalcaneal joint, and one way to fix that is basically to fuse the joint. So again, triple arthrodesis is commonly used in those situations. So those are the two primary reasons triple arthrodesis is used. And... It's been a. It's been the first one. First person to kind of talk about triple orthodesis was uh, Dr. Ryerson, I believe, and people have been using uh, triple orthodesis for a while with some modifications too. And one of the common uh, complication of triple orthodesis is uh, increased secondary arthritic de de degeneration. What that means is after they fuse it, they all they the, the foot basically. Is fused in a basically a perpendicular kind of fashion, and after and when people are walking, obviously, there's since there's very little motion available to the foot, they often develop arthritic degeneration because often the 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 way they walk will conflict with the the fused form of the foot. So, people have been thinking about triple orthodesis and perhaps if there's any other way to kind of accomplish the same thing while reducing the complication. And that's where medial double orthodesis comes in. Medial double orthodesis is basically fusing the medial, the double orthodesis of the medial side. So that will be the talonavicular joint and the talonavicular So they are not fusing the calcaneal cuboid joint. So the, since, again, to reiterate, the problem with triple orthodesis is an increased secondary arthritic degeneration. And people thought, people have been using medial double orthodesis and this journal is just to evaluate how it's carried out and potentially compare that to triple arthrodesis. So the first thing they do with the medial arthrodesis procedure is they make only one uh, incision, a single incision starting from the posterior of the medial malleolus to the, uh, to the medial cuneiform and it kind of follows a path of a posterior tibial uh, tendon and when you're doing this initial cut, initial dissection, you have to be careful to not damage the saphenous nerve and vein that runs along that path. And afterwards, the first structures you will see are the superficial deltal ligament, which include uh, the tibial navicular, tibial calcaneo, and a talo -tibial, uh, the uh, posterior talo -tibial, uh, ligaments. And you kind of uh, excise those things out. Uh, and you're gonna come back later on to suture it back, but you, you, for now you take out so that you have your surgical field ready for uh, kind of the area where you're gonna be dissecting uh, ready. So, because the thing is, you have to go through all the layers one by one and until until you hit your uh, joint layer. And that's where you basically cut out the cartilage and then fuse the bones together. So, this is the first kind of, uh, and you could probably do a, a dissection here and then cut out the ligaments. So after the uh, dissection, excision of the superficial deltoid ligament, you will come across a posterior tibial tendon sheath. 
and after that you would inspect it. And at this point, the authors noted that a lot of times, a prime, one of the primary uh, indication for a triple orthopedesis, like I said earlier, was uh, severe flat foot deformity. And that often is accompanied by kind of a damaging of the posterior tibial tendon. And tendinosis is what we call it, where the intersubstance of the tendon is damaged. And if that's the case, this is the point where you kind of take a look at the posterior tibial tendon and make a judgment call of whether or not you want to excise it or you want to save it. And after you move the sheath, you could uh, look at the tailored navicular capsule and go transect that out. So after you cut out the posterior ta uh, tibial tendon sheath, uh, you will also note the flexor digitum longus present in the inferior to the posterior tibial tendon. And you want to make sure you move that to the inferior side to keep that tendon safe from any um, cutting. And also, you... Uh, at this level, you will also find the deep deltoid ligament, which is the anterior tibial tear ligament that you can cut out from here. And you move on to basically one more ligament before the actual joint. And it, uh, you, there's one more ligament that's holding the talus and the calcaneal, and it's, it's the talocalcaneal interosseous ligament. That is basically kind of centrally located, that kind of connects the central portion of the calcaneus to the talus. And you cut that out using a 0.25 inch uh, osteotome. And at, at that point, the talus and the calcaneus can freely move apart. So now that the joints are uh, movable, the next thing is you need to prepare the joint surfaces. And in order for fusion to occur, you need to get rid of the cartilage because cartilages don't allow any bone development. That's why uh, a lot of times like uh, joint problems are kind of permanent. You never heal back from that. So you know to prepare. So how they prepare is they basically get rid of the cartilage. So now that the the uh, talocalcaneal are no longer um, attached by ligaments anymore, you need to make sure that the surface, posterior surface, posterior facet of the calcaneus and the uh, of the talus that makes up the subtalar joint are basically out of uh, without any cartilage. So they will uh, they will debris the posterior facet using a curved curette. And they irrigate it and they also penetrate basically poke holes to the subchondral bone um, using a 2.0 to 3.5 millimeter from the far side of the subtalar joint. And what that means is basically you're putting these little holes around the bones of, of the uh, talus from the far side to make sure so that you weaken the basically subchondral bone. And you start from the far side because that allows kind of better visual field. You don't cloud up, cloud your field when you start from the, your closer side. So you want to start from the out, far side to you so that you, as you come across, you, the debris doesn't, isn't uh, clouding your vision and clouding your field. And then after you put, 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 uh, put a bunch of holes circumferentially, you basically use a 0.25 inch curved osteotome to basically kind of uh, chip it away, the subchondral bone, and the, it should basically come off. And people, the author used the fish scaling or shingling. Yeah, that's what they use. That's the technical term that the, um, I guess, doctors use when they, when they use that technique of getting rid of the subcomputer bone. So that's how they're preparing the subtalar joint. And then the next is after they prepare the subta uh, subtalar posterior facet, talus and calcaneus, they get rid of the cartilage using the mentioned uh, method, they move into the talonavicular joint. And in here, they use a pin distractor to basically look at the talonavicular joint. And instead of using any, like a drill or um, uh, or osteum tone, people, uh, the authors noted that oftentimes with the uh, flat foot deformity, talonavicular joint results in a kind of, it's already somewhat necrotic, so it's gonna be spongy, it's gonna be mushy. So you don't need to use those tools. So you could just use a regular ronger, kind of like you can kind of snip it away at the joint cartilage. So now that the uh, the talar navicular and talocalcaneus are the subtalar joint is basically in preparation for a fusion, you have to make sure you put the foot into a proper position based before you fuse it. And one thing to keep in mind is you do not want to keep the foot in any form of varus. Varus is extremely bad. If you want to err, uh, if you want to, if you're gonna err, you want to err in the side of valgus a little bit. So they recommend that you want to unlock the mid tarsal joint, and in, in order to do that, one way to do it is keep the hind, hind, hind foot neutral with mid foot ibducted, 
and forfeit, forfeited supination. And one way to do that is basically dorsiflex the hallux and kind of load with the other hand, low other finger, the medial column is what they suggested. And after that's the subtalar joint, and after you do that, there's you could fuse it using two large, um, partially threaded. I don't think it's cannulated. Let me double check here. Um, two large diameter, partially threaded, cannulated screw. Well, it is cannulated. The screws insert re retrograde, meaning you go from the calcaneus to the talus, and you fuse it. So. It, they said that you could either use one screw or two screw, but if you're using one screw, you just go from the perpendicular to the posterior, perpendicular to the posterior facet of calcaneus, shoot one up. And if you're using two screws, you basically split up the calcaneal tuberosity to medial and lateral part of it, and then you just put one screw per tuberosity. So now that's done. That's that's how you fuse the subtalar joint, talar calcaneal joint, and then now you go into the talar navicular joint. Um, after preparing with the Ronger, what you want to do is you want to again put the tailor navicular joint into proper position and you want to abduct the tailor head with pronatory force on the first ray to reduce the medial column and then you could basically fuse it with a uh, partially threaded 2 to 4 millimeter partially threaded cannulated screw within the navicular tuberosity and then after, after you fuse it together you could put a staples on the dorsal aspect lateral aspect dorsal lateral aspect of the dorsal lateral dorsal aspect of the tailored navicular joint kind of on the top side of it and then the x-rays uh, here will show you you can see the two little thing on the top is basically the, the compression screws and then you can also see this compression and staples and then you can also see this one screw going from the tailored navicular joint and then you can obviously see the big screws from the calcaneus to the tail is going through um, after that, you just want to suture back up. You want to use these, they recommend a zero absorbable Brady suture for the capsule. And for the superficial deltoid and the deep, deep deltoid ligament, you want to use zero absorbable Brady suture. And then three zero for the sub Q. And then three zero for the non absorbable for, or the staple for the superficial uh, skin, basically. And the follow up consists of basically uh, five to seven. They want to see them after five to seven days. And since it, it takes bone for six to eight weeks, they need to be in short leg cast for four to six weeks. And they could change cast midway. And after four to six weeks, they could start their physical therapies and they'll be on their walking boot for three to four weeks. And they recommend that total follow up duration will range from six months to nine months. So after that, the author wanted to talk about the discussion part. And the discussion basically talks about what triple orthodesis does and kind of also state what medial double orthodesis can do and kind of compare it together. Well, not really comparison, but just talking about it. So triple orthodesis, the one of the main disadvantages of a triple orthodesis is two incisions, one on the medial side and then one, one on the lateral side. Lateral side, of course, needed for the calcium cuboid fusion. So one of the obvious complications will be the extra incision that's made on the lateral side of the foot that will obviously result in a higher wound uh, complication. And triple orthodesis, it was stated in the paper that results about 3 to 33% chance of a wound complication. That's one of the main things. Uh, another thing is that sometimes you could end up in a varus form uh, and that could end up causing more pain than before the surgery of a triple orthodesis and the triple orthodesis has a 93% satisfaction rate which is relatively high in my opinion so it's it's not it's not bad it's still people still use it today and it's pretty good now medial double orthodesis primary benefit is only one incision on the medial aspect of it since they're not fusing the calcaneal cuboid joint to joint there's no point of making an incision on the lateral side so obviously the wound complication is going to go down the, the rate's going to go down. Also, the fusion rate for medial double orthodesis range from 89 to 100%. Another advantage of a medial double orthodesis is that since it's not fusing the calcaneal cuboid joint, which gives you about a little bit of range of motion, um, is very the calcaneal cuboid joint doesn't move much, but it kind of gives you like five degrees of movement or so. So, what one thing that the author talked about is that since it doesn't fuse the calcaneal cuboid joint, the patients will have some sort of a movement on the lateral side of the foot. And that allows uh, dissipation of 
pressure, plantar pressure on the foot if the it's bec- uh, when the medial column is too tight in a way. So uh, provides some sort of a um, buffer to the pressure that could be exhibited that could be loading onto the foot when they're walking. So that could kind of result in a um, few cases of post uh, surgery co- uh, arthritis pain. And one of the critics of medial double arthrodesis stated that uh, <clears throat> one of the neurovascular bundle runs in the posterior medial aspect of it, where the incisions are being, incisions are being made. So you got to be a little bit careful when you're doing that. And someone did a study where basically they evaluated the subtalar joint to the neurovascular bundle and they found out it was about like 2.1 centimeter uh, apart. So it's relative to so the author wanted to say that it's relatively safe. When in, in regards to damaging, potentially damaging a neurovascular bundle in that area. And then the author stated, talk, uh, talked about other uh, paper that basically compared triple orthodesis and medial double orthodesis in, in a, in a, in a like side to side, and they basically said that it's really comparable. Uh, one's not significantly better than the other one. Um, patients are satisfied with either of the procedures. So the impression I got from this paper is that it's more of a justification as to why people can do medial double orthodesis. People have been doing medial double orthodesis for a while now, and this paper kind of is recently published. This is this year um, published article basically to uh, give support to that to people who use medial double orthodesis. But I don't necessarily think that it could replace triple orthodesis. It's, triple orthodesis is very uh, it's, it's, been, it's been going on for a long time. So so that was just about this paper. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll try to um, put out more videos as frequently as I can. Uh, I just realized the room is a little bit dark, so I apologize for that. Um, thanks for watching, and please remember to subscribe to help me out, and uh, I'll see you guys later.